Hi, I'm Femi OK with Malika Bilal, who is in Park City, Utah. We are wrapping up our coverage of this year's Sundance Film Festival. Hello there, Malika. Hi, Femi. Thanks for that. I am here alongside filmmaker Cody Lusage and indigenous activist Curtis Yazi and Mark Tilson Jr. So right now you are live in the stream and on YouTube. And remember that if you want to add a comment, you can do so live and we will try and get that comment right into this show. Hi, I'm Robbie Barrett. I'm a scientist from West Virginia. I just moved to Silicon Valley and I'm in the stream. The movement against construction of a multi-billion dollar pipeline across Native American territories last year sparked solidarity among indig indigenous peoples and civil rights activists. In Akichita, the Battle of Standing Rock, we get to see up close the stories of those who gathered in the U.S. state of North Dakota to say a no to the Dakota Access Pipeline. Have a look. These things that I saw were in a dream that I had like a long time ago. Anyway, my spiritual teacher was alive then. And in this dream that I had, him and I, we were walking through a camp. And as we walked through this camp, there was all these flags, different kinds of flags. And there was canopies and tents, and they were many, many, he was crowded. And I asked him, is this a powwow? Are we at a powwow? Where are we? Where are we? What is this? So the next day I woke up and I went to visit him and I explained the dream to him. And I asked him his thoughts on it. And he had no answer for me. Many activists known as water protectors were hospitalized over the course of the demonstrations, injured by police officials trying to disperse crowds. U.S. federal courts repeatedly denied requests to suspend the project, now in operation following an order last January from President Donald Trump to expedite its completion. A number of water protectors were prosecuted for their actions, and in the six months since, the pipeline has leaked multiple times. Helping us to unpack the legacy of Standing Rock and joining us via Skype in Tucson, Arizona, we have Jenny Monet. She's a Native American journalist who writes about indigenous affairs around the world. She also covered the Standing Rock movement for Indian country. But we're going to start our conversation with Malika, who's in Park City. Thanks, Femi. Uh, Cody, you are the director of Akichita, the Battle of Standing Rock, and this has been billed as the only native-made film about the uprising at Standing Rock. Tell us how it even came to be. Well, I was actually already in North Dakota working on another production, and <clears throat> when I had heard about what was going on over at Standing Rock, I uh, just said, basically just dropped me off over there. And so I got dropped off over there and I had run into a couple relatives, a couple cousins and some friends that were already there in camp. So I kind of just fell right into camp and I, ha I had my laptop and my camera with me. So um, I just I just started doing these little small little video clips um, because I wanted to help to spread the message and get the word out and raise awareness about what was going on there. Mm -hmm. And after I was there for about a week, I actually got hit up by Sundance and by the Redford Center. And they actually asked me if I had heard anything about Santa Rock. And I was like, yeah, I'm actually here right now. And they're like, well, what are you doing? And I said, I'm making these little clips. And they were like, well, can we uh, see them? And I said, sure. So I, so I sent them to them and they were like, wow, these are great. Can we blast these across our networks? And I said, yeah. <laughs> and so for our international audience, I just <clears throat> want to take a pause there because they may not know the significance of this, but the Redford Center and, and the people behind this film festival don't often just go to people and say, we want you. Well, yeah, that was, <laughs> that was, the, that was the thing. And so, so after about a week went by, uh, we got mi millions of views on those clips that they that they posted for us. And after about a week went by, they they came back and they said, "Hey, do you want to do a um, feature documentary out there?" And I was like, "No, because you know I want to do these little clips and mm -hmm. I want to fight." And I knew if I was tied down to a 
feature length documentary, I, I wouldn't be able to release all those clips. I would actually have to hold on to the footage through the whole time. And so I said no. And then some people started bringing it to my attention. They're like, you know, Cody, they don't normally reach out like right. that. And 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 then they kept reaching out to me and they were trying to stress the fact that there was, you know, all these other filmmakers that are going to be coming out to these non-native filmmakers. And they wanted, they wanted to make sure there was at least one, you know, native film crew on the ground telling the story from the inside. Mm -hmm. And it started to register in my head. And then I seen... 50 non-native filmmakers flocking out there all trying to tell the story and it was just cameras everywhere all mm -hmm. across camp and then I, I just sort of came to, to the re realization that this was a massive responsibility actually mm -hmm. um and now you're here uh, we're in park city the sundance film festival and we are sitting next to two protagonists in your documentary why them how did how did you go about picking uh the people that, that showed up in the film so <laughs> In uh, thinking about how to frame this story of, of Standing Rock, it was, it was like Standing Rock became this sort of um, worldwide known like thing that was going on and people just started flocking there just to come there and take selfies and to say that they were there and to camp and to hang out and they weren't actually there to actually stop the pipeline. And that would have been so easy just to pick one of those characters because they're like, heck yeah, camera, follow me around, you know? But I really wanted to find the characters who actually had something to do with fighting and stopping the Dakota Access Pipeline. And this was a difficult task because a lot of these people, you know, they didn't really want cameras following them around, were under constant FBI surveillance. Wow. Um, and so that was, that was, that was kind of difficult. Um, but then through time, you know, you had to earn trust and respect and... Yeah, so so that's kind of how I got to some of these characters. Yes. So there was a lot of cameras, you know what I mean? Um, there'd be days where a lot of people would be marching and shutting down construction, and you'd have all these people, um, non-native people, just in your face, you know, with cameras, and it's just like you're already in a high intense situation. And so we a actually started just kicking away people that we were just really annoying, you know? Mm -hmm. And that were just trying to profit off of what we were doing and tr trying to benefit and push their own content without actually consulting us. Um, but after a while, you start to see the same people um, showing up over and over and you, you know, you're like, who's that guy? You yeah. know what I mean? Uh, and, you begin to trust them. The, yeah, trust. So it, it took a while, but we love Cody. <laughs> that me? I have a, I actually have a question for Cody, really, uh, because of the great risk that was involved. My first encounter with Cody Lusich, the director, was, was of him, uh, really kind of taking on a very combat style role with his camera, his DSLR, um, just days before what we called the Treaty Camp Raid, which was on October 27th, 2016. And I saw him in this very kind of covert kind of way with his camera going to get some shots that um, could be really telling in, in part of this narrative. And Cody, I'd just like to know, you know, what kind of risk did you feel like you were you were facing under this kind of militarized threat? Yeah, so, I mean, there was always bullets whizzing by. There was always, you know, percussion grenades going off, sound cannons, mace, tear gas. I mean, I was I was tear gassed a couple dozen times, mace directly in my eyes by those mace cannons, maybe five times. I was shot with rubber bullets. So there was always there was always that. Um, and there was there was also always this sort of like, you know, being the only native film out there. And this huge conversation going on now about uh, uh, about natives taking back control of their own narrative um, is, is, is just it, 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 it sort of came a huge conversation at this time also. So there was a lot of weight on my shoulders as far as like telling the story properly, you know, because I think the narrative has has been for so long is that the reason why natives don't get to tell their own stories and why non-natives get to tell them is because they're not as good of filmmakers. Mm -hmm. You know that the non-natives are better. That's why they get the big budgets to tell all these all these big Hollywood movies and whatnot. So, so there was there was a lot of weight on my shoulders beyond just the bullets whizzing by out there on the front line. You know, um, and I mean there was like like for example, for my hard drives, I have my hard drives out there the whole time, and we're out there camping. You know, and so I I dug a little hole in the back side of my teepee where I'd stash my hard drives every day when I'd go out on an action or whatever. Wow. Um, and then, like I was talking about before, just being able to film these characters who were actually doing something out there, 
um, you know, they didn't want cameras following them around, you know, I, I, I mean, not only so Mark is smiling at not that. Only, Mark, did you want cameras following you around? Um, uh, there was a there was a couple of requests from Cody Lucich to uh, uh, record some of our planning sessions. I was like, no, uh, that's, that sounds really incriminating, uh, <laughs> opens up a whole legal liability. And I uh, did not want any cameras but Mark, uh, that intimately. But Mark, yes. there, was, there, was, there was a lot of strategizing on camera. There was a lot of you talking through this documentary. It's a work in progress right now. But I see that you're an integral part of what happened, what could have perhaps been done better. I want to show our audience a little clip where you are welcoming some well-known celebrities into the camp. Have a look at this. This morning, they actually showed up in force to shut down the blockade and warn that the camp is going to be uh, raided. We had Mark Ruffalo and uh, Jesse Jackson uh, who showed up. I don't think they wanted to do a high profile arrest of the Reverend Jesse Jackson. It's scary, man, to see people with guns on a public road <laughs> where all people are doing is gathering. There's no weaponry over there. There's nothing of violence. Where do we live? This can't be America. They scrambled so, my film. So this is film that was taken just now. You saw it. And somehow they're able to scramble it. Data, yeah. like text messages and phone calls, are being monitored by law enforcement. Yes. That's some dark, dark, dark stuff going on here, man. It's Mark, what I see from your input into this film is that you are planning a war. There are skirmishes, there are battles, there are conflicts, but I, I didn't quite see Standing Rock as that until we went right inside. What is the story that only this film is telling that we haven't seen from other filmmakers and from other journalists? I, th I, think, uh, I think this is like a lesson on how movements work, how movements don't work, um, a path towards victory, and how movements sometimes sabotage themselves. Uh, very simply, what we needed to do for victory is to continuously go at our enemies of the energy transfer partners who is building the Dakota Access Pipeline. And it shows a lot of our struggles and our conflict that's not just necessarily outside forces. It's almost as if uh, the militarized police and the mercenaries were a force of nature that we were ready to fight, that we were ready to combat, that we were ready to outflank and outsmart, but ultimately are defeated uh, by our internal struggles. Mm. I have this. I think. Yes, Jenny. Can, can I put? Can I put this to you, Jenny? This is coming a live comment on YouTube. So watching this program on YouTube, Room says it doesn't matter how much the people protest. The powers that be will always just sweep them aside. That's a, a legacy question. The impact to Standing Rock. Go ahead, Jenny. What do you think? Yeah, that really was, I think, most profound about the clip that was just displayed here because it really gets at the heart of the actual absence that was felt at Standing Rock at a most critical hour. That footage came on the eve of what I had mentioned before was this, this militarized raid of what was known as the treaty camp. And the intensity was high, the scrambling of all the digital equipment, that was recorded by the indigenous peoples themselves. There was really actually no media on the scene. And I think that that is another strong narrative that I don't think we've come to really discuss as much is the importance of that social media played in this movement and how it really was a galvanizing force around the world. I wanted to bring up uh, this tweet here we got from someone named Indian Viewpoint. That's their handle. Uh, and Yaz, I know you wanted to get in there, so I'll direct this to you. They write, I would say that the no dapple struggle, and of course that's that hashtag uh, Dakota Access Pipeline, is best viewed within the context of defending sovereignty and the right to defend the water and land. Not necessarily a civil rights issue. So this was about sovereignty, people said. Do you think it was framed in that way? And do you think that, that this film helped change that framing? Um, well, for a lot of people that I was there with from the beginning to the end, we weren't there in thinking about civil rights or, you know, a big part of it was treaty, treaty rights were being violated as they always have been, but it was about the water, you know, we're all downstream, it was a human rights issue, you know, we were fighting other people to fight for the, the those people, um, so I think that was one of the biggest things that was co consistently like, spoken about between our own circles was that we're here for the water at the end of the day. Mm.
Uh, and that thought is actually backed up again by YouTube with C. Drake saying this is about water rights, not a need for gas. Clean water and a clean environment is the right of all people. Mark, I see you nodding. I, I really want to get your take on this about the movement, the Standing Rock movement. Delani Robert asks on Twitter, again, watching the show, the Occupy movement and no dapple resistance both represent the effectiveness of frontline encampments unpredictability, fluidity in action, implementation and tactics. This is what Standing Rock has given the world. Agree? Uh, that was very articulately mm. said, and I agree. Um, I think for us, uh, I'm from Pine Ridge, I'm Oglala Lakota on the Pine Ridge Indian Reservation. My family and most of my tribe drink the water that's south of Standing Rock and south of the Dakota Access Pipeline. Mm. We came up there to fight for our survival. And primarily, it, other people have many opinions about this, but it comes back to reiterate what Yaz just said was it comes back to water. We came up there to fight to protect the water continuously and always. That's the heart of this struggle. And there, you can talk about treaties. We can part, uh, incorporate issues around sovereignty and correcting the injustices of the past. But primarily, this was uh, us fighting for our, our existence, for our survival and the right to have clean water. So when you, you talk about the significance add, significance oh, I'm sorry. of that, go ahead, Jenny. Go ahead, Jenny. No, I think I would also just add that I think that, you know, while this, you know, may have just been one tribe's fight for clean drinking water and to honor the treaties, it was emblematic of what's been happening around the indigenous world for generations. This collusion of government forces uh, and, and militarized policing. I mean, as we heard throughout the movement at Standing Rock, it became so much more than just a pipeline. And that's why, in popular view, Standing Rock is being seen as the greatest indigenous-led movement of our modern times. And I'm wondering, with that kind of weight, what these filmmakers feel like as this becomes a work in progress, what kind of mark this needs to make, um, because it is such a, a, a token of a, a historical record. Yeah, so, I mean, ult ultimately, when making this movie, we were making it for the Native community, for the Indigenous peoples um, in mind. Um, we knew that it would, you know, that, that other non-Natives would watch it, other non-Natives would like it, but it was specifically being made for the Indigenous people, and it's because our generation, we were all inspired by the AIM generation, the American Indian movement, the generation of our parents and our uncles and our, and our, and our aunties. And that has allowed us to be able to do what we're doing today. We're sort of building upon what they laid down for us. And so in this movie, we're showing what we're doing now in, in this generation. And so hopefully this film can help inspire the next generation, the 9, 10, 11, 12 year olds right now who will watch us and be like, damn, those guys are cool, you know, out there fighting for our land and our water, locking down, you know, scouting, pouring over maps in the middle of the night, mm -hmm. you know. Um, so hopefully that's the that's the ultimate goal for this, is to be able to help in inspiring the next generation. It might already be happening. We got this tweet from Amina Zamora on Twitter. She says, it's very important to discuss the significance of Indigenous films participation at the Sundance Film Festival. And of course, this being one of them, there are actually eight Indigenous-led films here this year. But I want to share this tweet from the Redford Center, uh, because this happened at the premiere on Wednesday. Redford Center writes, we'd like to share this moving scene from, yesterday, from yesterday's Akisita film premiere when Standing Rock Water Protectors, featured in the film, joined the filmmakers on stage in song. Have a listen. They write, thank you to water protectors everywhere for enduring these fights and filling us all with hope. Cody, what did that moment mean for you? Right there when we all walked up on stage? Mm -hmm. um, it, it was, it, to, to be filming all of these water protectors and living with them and fighting with them and to be able to show this movie to them for the first time and bring them up on stage so it's not just me during the Q&A where I actually open it up to the audience who can ask any any one of them a mm -hmm. question that they want to know? Mm -hmm. I think um, felt good because because I did what I set out to do, and I'm able to share this with everybody who was involved, and not just try to be like me, 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 you know, but try to bring everybody up there also so that they have a chance to talk and people have a chance to talk with them. Mm -hmm.
Mark, there's a moment in the film where you are welcoming some veterans. They are the veterans who stand for Standing Rock. There are thousands of people at the camp and they also are thinking that maybe, maybe something could actually happen and you could achieve your aims. Have a look at the video. Thousands and thousands of people come throughout the country for this one moment and all they want to do is just step up. We'll take a rubber bullet for you. Now what did we say? No thanks? There was a lot of people who, who really expected like the tide to turn at that point and, and basically it was just it was it was chaos and disorganization. It was heartbreaking. It was heartbreaking to have the numbers, to have the vision, to have the willing people, everything in place. All that we needed to do is simply go. Simply choose to win and then win. Mark, this is so painful to watch, to hear, to, to watch being documented. Where are we with Standing Rock now? Where are you with Standing Rock now? What's happened? Um, you, you kind of caught me. This is one of the most painful moments of my life mm. that I take a deep personal responsibility in my failure as a leader mm. and as somebody who very possibly we could have stopped the Dakota Access Pipeline. Currently, the Dakota Access Pipeline is constructed and uh, the water, uh, the oil is flowing uh, underneath the Missouri River. And there's been, there's been several leaks already. Um, the fight continues. Uh, the fight continues of going after other pipelines. The final stage of the Dakota Access Pipeline is called the Bayou Bridge Pipeline. And there are other pipeline fights throughout the country and into Canada and Mexico that are continuous and ongoing. So the fight didn't end at Standing Rock. It went elsewhere. It has spread throughout the country. I'm, gl I'm glad you actually said that. I want to share two tweets with our audience. The first is from Daniela Zalkman. She shares a picture uh, of, of what uh, the area looks like now. All that remains where all the no dapple camps once stood, um, and, and it is pretty remarkable. But Picking up on what you said, Mark, there's also a tweet here from Big Indian Gyasi. He writes, the attacks on native lands have never stopped, never. DAPL was an attack on native land. Keystone, the Keystone oil pipeline, is an attack on native land. He also mentions Bears Ears, and that's here in Utah where we are today. Uh, that's a national monument designated by former President Obama and then drastically reduced in size under President Trump. So this is an ongoing fight. Yaz, what is it that you're keeping your eye on next? Uh, for me personally, it's um, there's only a few people that are there at the end of the day. There was thousands and thousands of people showed up, but at the end of the day, dead of winter, with holding a shield, there's about ten of you, and so it's about finding those people because they're across Turtle Island and building these people up and healing with them and starting over, you know. Yeah. So I'm just wondering, Cody, when we're looking at impact, I've, I've got here from, this, from the Smithsonian Institute, one of the signs from Standing Rock, it is now going to be a part of the Smithsonian. It's one part of their collections. It, it shows the power of solidarity. As far as your work is concerned, I know it's a work in progress, your film. What do you want to happen to it? Who do you want it to appeal to? I wanted to appeal to anybody who feels that they're hopeless, um, that they can stand up in their own communities without weapons. They can use their bodies. They can figure out ways how to stop construction. Um, I have the hopes that it can inspire them so that they can do it in their in their own communities, even just with a handful of people. And I think as both of these two guys realize right here that sometimes, or actually most of the time, we were way more effective with just with just a handful of people than when we had 10,000 people. I'm just going to show you where you can see more showings of the Battle of Standing Rock here on the Sundance Institute page. It's still work in progress. It's not finished yet, but keep a look out for it. I want to say thank you so much to all of our guests today and to all the filmmakers who joined us this week from the annual Sundance Film Festival. And we look forward to hearing more about your films in the future. Until then, you know where you'll find Malika and myself. We'll be online using hashtag AJStream. Thanks for watching. Take care.